Welding instructor Alex DeClaire knows firsthand how VR training platforms like ForgeFX can help meet the demand for skilled workers. Anywhere you go look, there's going to be a shortage of welders. VR training can help welding students learn the skills they need to begin and advance in their career. The beauty of virtual reality is it simulates that exact muscle memory that they need. Explore more stories like Alex's at meta.com slash metaverse impact. At Atlantic Union Bank, it's easy to make a video appointment and enjoy personal or business banking on your schedule. When life is pulling you in all directions, finding time to visit the bank can be difficult. But Atlantic Union Bank will come to you. Just go online, schedule a video appointment, and talk to a knowledgeable banker, someone who can answer your questions and even help you switch accounts. Isn't it time to experience service on your terms? For video appointments that bring the bank to you, visit AtlanticUnionBank.com. I'm your host, Annie Bowles, and this is News Du Jour. Welcome to News Du Jour. You may be wondering, why am I, Annie Bowles, here hosting this podcast? I usually start by telling people I'm a political baby. You see, my parents met working on Capitol Hill. By the time I was two, I had been in my first political commercial and even got lost crawling around the West Wing. Don't worry, Al Gore found me. My family then moved abroad when I was nine, and I attended an international school in Brussels with kids from all over the world, and it is this type of global perspective that I also bring to our show. I graduated from American University in D.C. after studying political science and art history, as well as interning on both sides of Capitol Hill. I even interned down the hall from where my parents met. I'm now pursuing a professional certificate in journalism at NYU in conjunction with Rolling Stone magazine. I guess I was always that friend in the group who cared deeply about not just what was going on politically, but also globally. I often kept my own friends informed through high school and into young adulthood, so I guess I've always done a version of this show. I'm genuinely passionate about following the news, and I'm here to break it down for you guys every weekday. We always strive to be a calmer space to get your news, or as one listener put it, like getting your news from a well-informed bestie. I'm so glad you're here. Hey everyone, happy Monday. I have a ton to catch you guys up on, to put it lightly. The past week has been very chaotic on my end. I had a number of personal things going on, along with technical difficulties that have been looming from last week. Long story short, I might be moving hosting platforms again for the show, which I really don't want to do, but I may be in a position where I have to do that so that we don't run into more issues. But long story short, I wanted to issue a series of like reminders and updates here at the top, and then we're going to get into five mini stories and then only two longer stories. But trust me, they're long. Let's get into it. So for our first reminder, Trump's hush money Manhattan trial begins today, April 15th in New York City. This is something that we are going to be watching very closely because, as we've mentioned in the past, this may be the only one of Trump's criminal trials to go to court prior to the presidential election, which is mere months away, you guys. I know it doesn't feel like it because this is typically the stage where we'd really be getting to know the different candidates and they'd be shouting to the rooftops about who they are and what they care about. But these are two familiar candidates, so it feels a little more quiet than usual, despite the fact that this is a completely unprecedented race with all of these trials going on. Again, we will be watching these things closely and keeping you guys posted all along the way. 
And then I also wanted to update you guys about our bill, Senate Bill 1470, which if you're new here, this is a bipartisan bill that we are helping to endorse and get pushed through the Oklahoma legislature. So basically, this bill is headed to the House floor on Wednesday. And this is something that has been long awaited. There's been a lot of delays. And, you know, who's to say there won't be another delay? It definitely could happen. And we will keep you guys posted if it does happen. You know, there's a lot of ups and downs when it comes to politics, but there's also like sideways things that happen. And I would put this in that category of like a sideways thing. This wasn't anything, this delay wasn't anything to do with our bill. It was to do with taxes and basically infighting between Republicans in the Oklahoma legislature. So that delayed 41 different bills from getting voted on. So this is definitely not just affecting us and it really has nothing to do with our legislation, but it is delaying our legislation. So anywho, we don't know what time yet on Wednesday, and we may not know. So far, our bill has been almost the first order of business in each vote. So my plan is to get there super early, as early as I can, and just stay until the vote is heard. My stomach is in knots, but I'm also so ready for moving forward with this bill. Again, we'll keep you guys posted, and you'll hear about things first on my Instagram, which is at It's Annie Bowles on Instagram. So without further ado, we will jump into our mini stories for today. First and foremost, the U.S. Senate is set to hold a hearing from Boeing, you guys, about their manufacturing pre- practices. And all I have to say about that is it's about time. You know, Congress is wanting to make sure that This company is complying with federal standards because after so many mishaps, it's hard not to believe the whistleblowers were on to something. We'll certainly keep you guys posted. And I know this is long awaited when it comes to the public because this has had a lot of flyers spooked. For our second mini story today, there was a mall stabbing in Australia that has left six people dead and a community shaken. So this has graphic details, but so feel free to skip ahead now if you don't want to hear them. But those stabbed in this mall included a nine month old baby who was stabbed by this assailant. The man who committed these awful acts was named Anthony Cook, and he was killed on scene by a police officer. It is believed he acted alone. Acts of mass violence are very rare in Australia, so this one has really affected the entire nation. Our prayers are up for the victims and their loved ones. And then for our third mini story, a man drove a semi truck into the Texas Department of Public Safety offices after he was denied the renewal of his commercial truck license. So, 14 people were struck in these offices by the semi-truck. One was killed. Three were airlifted to major hospitals. Three more were transported to smaller hospitals. And eight were treated on the scene for their injuries. The man driving this truck, Clenard Parker, was unharmed. He was apprehended and he faces several felony charges. He had previously been arrested for arson and for trespassing. So for our fourth mini story, Japan and the U.S. are creating a stronger alliance after a history of conflict. The prime minister of Japan just visited the White House for the second time in recent months, and he, alongside President Biden, announced a series of enhancements between the diplomatic relationships from economic to military. So this relationship has become more important as of late. To both our nations because we both face threats from China and North Korea. We'll definitely keep you guys posted as things unfold between President Biden and the country of Japan. And for our final mini story today, Trump's ex-finance chief, Alan Weisenberg, he was sentenced to five months in prison for perjury following false statements he made regarding Trump's business transactions. At age 76, this is the second time that he's doing time for protecting Trump's white-collar secrets. 
Yeah, that story is a really sad one to me. It is one that obviously we've covered in the past, but I wanted to give you guys that update. He's officially going in to serve some time. For our first longer story today, though, I do have to issue a content warning. This story involves war. So in case you've been living under a rock and hadn't heard this, Iran has attacked Israel and the U.S. and Jordan have been interceding. On Saturday evening central time, Iran attacked Israel directly with a barrage of missiles, bombs, and over 300 suicide drones. There is one piece of good news, though, about these attacks. Almost none of the many, many rockets fired at Israel reached their intended targets. But unfortunately, the good news ends there. The defense of Israel was provided by the Iron Dome technology that Israel has to protect its citizens, as well as intercessions by both the U.S. and Jordan. They shot down missiles mid-air. Iran and Israel have been locked in what experts call a shadow war for quite some time now. Basically, they strike at each other's proxies or, you know, personnel, but on foreign soil. Basically, it's a passive aggressive way of fighting a war where they're not directly attacking one another, but they are, you know, attacking one another in these indirect ways. Another example of how they do this is providing weaponry to people who are directly fighting them. So it's sort of, again, a roundabout way of attacking one another. So this attack where Iran was literally shooting missiles at Israel was something new. One of these two enemies directly attacking the other just hasn't happened. There's no more shadow boxing. These two are taking their fight out into the day- daylight, metaphorically at least, because this happened at night. Hamas, of course, expressed support for this attack. Iranian leadership celebrated in the streets of Tehran, although what they accomplished beyond a waste of weapons, I am not sure. Perhaps it was a heightened global tension that they were after, and if so, they definitely accomplished that goal. What's more, the Houthis in Yemen actually signed a diplomatic agreement with Russia and China, allowing their ships to pass safely, according to Bloomberg. This just further solidifies the relationship between the Houthi rebels, Iran, China, and Russia with formal diplomatic agreements. All of this edges us in a direction that we do not want to be going in, especially with the U.S. presidential election looming. Given the significance of this officially becoming a tet a tet a you know front and center war, I wanted to remind you guys what is at stake here. So I've gone ahead and reshared our bonus episode with Elika Laban, a member of the Persian diaspora, or essentially the people who have been forced to live in exile from their homeland of Iran. Elika's family have been part of the resistance against the Iranian regime for generations now. She's an attorney currently living and practicing here in the U.S. We interviewed her in the wake of the Woman Life Freedom protests. And since then, she has been invited to speak at the U.N. among many other collaborations with important people to basically help Americans and Westerners understand what the Iranian people are really up against. Mass torture and murder of their own people at the hands of their own government. Iran's treatment of its own people, as chronicled and confirmed by outside agencies such as Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, etc., is about as evil as it gets. Listen to our bonus episode in your feeds now to learn more. And with that, we will head over to the O.J. Simpson passing. I want to issue a content warning here. This story involves a murder and graphic details. So if you're older than me, you're probably someone who remembers O.J. Simpson as a star football player, a TV and movie actor whose life took a dark turn. But if you're my age or younger, you probably only remember the dark chapter, 1995, the glove that didn't fit and the high speed police chase down the highway. 
the Robert Kardashian of it all. That's what we know. But that career leading up to that court case really defined it. He was someone who was a household name, a beloved character. I know most of our audience is young, so I wanted to make sure you guys had this context. It was hard for a lot of people at the time to even imagine that this man was capable of what it looked like he did. As we know, statistics show that the most dangerous time for an abused partner is not when they are with their abuser, but when they leave their abuser. As per testimony in court, Nicole Brown Simpson called police nine times on her ex-husband, O.J. Simpson, for abusing her. On one of those occasions, the police found Nicole half-naked, hiding in the bushes of her own home, badly beaten and bruised at the hands of O.J. Simpson, who was arrested at the time. We also know that the confrontations did not stop when she divorced him. She called the police in late 1993 saying that he's back and attesting that he was stalking her and attempting to attack her at her new residence. In mid-1994, that's exactly where they found her nearly decapitated body and that of Ronald Goldman, a man she had been seeing briefly. And if you think about it, Every time that it escalated to the point where she felt the need to dial 911, there may have been many more times where things didn't quite get to that level. She, after all, was a celebrity, and so was her husband, and calling the police in that scenario would be a last resort. Chris Jenner, who was a dear friend of Nicole Brown Simpson before her death, you know, Kendall Jenner's middle name is Nicole after Nicole Brown Simpson, Chris Jenner told news cameras outside of the trial that Nicole had confided in her multiple times that he told Nicole multiple times that he would kill her and that he would get away with it. And maybe that's what happened. No one will ever be able to say for sure. But a civil trial after the infamous criminal one actually found that O.J. Simpson owed the families of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson a total of $33 million. You know, not chump change now and certainly not back then. But they have yet to recover those funds owed to them. And in case you guys didn't know, O.J. later committed armed robbery and kidnapping and was convicted of all charges against him. He spent nine years in prison and was released in 2017, according to his New York Times obituary. He also wrote a book entitled, If I Did It, outlining a hypothetical of how he would have carried out this grisly murder if he had done it, which is absolutely horrifying and something that it's hard to imagine a kind, innocent person doing. O.J. Simpson died of cancer at age 76. He leaves behind five children and a very complicated legacy. In writing this story, I cannot help but think about Nicole and if she were to have fought back, if she were to have killed the beloved O.J. Simpson in self-defense, There is a very good chance that she would have been locked up for it and that she'd probably still be there. She was trapped in her abuse even after divorcing him. And that's why it's vital that we work to pass Senate Bill 1470 here in Oklahoma and similar versions all around the country. Survivors do not want to have to defend themselves, but after calling the police over and over and over and getting no help, no safety. Things do often escalate to the point where victims are forced to choose themselves or their attacker. And when they do, they need a court system that is trauma informed as much as possible and to be served a punishment that actually befits the crime. Come out to the Oklahoma State Capitol with us this Wednesday to show your support for Senate Bill 1470. And that is the news du jour. Today, I wanted to leave you guys with the quote, how wonderful is it that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world? 
If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use to listen. A rate and review on that platform or a shout out on social media would mean the world to us and help us to be able to keep creating the news du jour and reach more people who need a calmer space to consume the news. But the best way to support all of our work is to become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash sugar free media. And that is also linked in our show notes. You can follow us on social media at newsdujour.podcast on both Instagram and TikTok. You can follow my personal account at it's Annie Bowles on both platforms as well. Any little noises you may hear in the background are my rescue pup. He has a little separation anxiety and always records with me. We appreciate you listening and look forward to telling you about the news again next time on News Du Jour. Broadcasting from... Hey, parents, Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast.